Right, let's get started. So I, when I was looking at the schedule, I'm thinking because this semester, I think it's uh, one week or two weeks shorter than the past semesters. Probably pretty much one week and a half shorter. And when I'm looking at the final exam in the final exam week, I don't think that will be good for us for this class because you guys are going to work uh, with the Arduino kit. Um, if you're doing this at home, uh, it's hard for me to collect all the kids afterwards. I'm, I've been losing all the kids uh, over the time. I think originally I bought, you know, sometimes 40 kids and 20 and then 10. So total I should have somewhere around 70 to 80 Arduino kits. Um, but I'm not having this many right now. I probably lost a ton or something at least. So I couldn't afford to keep buying all, all these keys over the time. So make sure you guys will return it back to me after you're done. So I would not move the final exam to the 15th week. So uh, we have Monday and Wednesday, right? For the 14th week. So I think the holiday start starts from Thursday, and then you are not coming back anymore. Did you hear that? So you know that, right? It's after Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Already? Is that mandatory? What? Why is that? Okay. So what I heard is, so here's the schedule, I think, uh, what I directly copied from the email from the department. So Thursday through Sunday are Thanksgiving break. So there's no reason to have the 25th as a break as well, right? I think this is probably just uh, uh, in his case, maybe he need to travel or something. Do you, are you traveling on Wednesday? Okay. Any of you guys are traveling on Wednesday? No? If I travel, you are fine. Uh, but just let me know. I, I can schedule the final exam for you individually, probably earlier than that. Hmm. Okay. So let's take a look. <clears throat> so we can do the final exam on, on Monday, November the 23rd. And uh, you guys can send the, they want to present, just record the presentation in video and send it to, upload to YouTube and send it to me the link. But other people couldn't see, probably won't be able to see your demonstration. Mm, I think that works, but just less fun, right? So you're doesn't like you're presenting and can answer questions from the, from the audience. Yeah. Uh, but if, if you have to do that, then... Okay, so I'm going to move the final exam to Monday, 23rd, November. And uh, you guys are going to form different teams for your project um, and upload the presentation as a YouTube video to your website, online report. Okay. Will that work? Okay. So literally, you guys are done for this class after the 23rd. Okay. Any questions on this? No? I'm going to do it. Uh, wrap up the advanced, no, the ESP32 tutorial really quick because that's for group two. Uh, probably we just need to need another five minutes to wrap it up and you guys can leave. You don't have to stay here. And uh, I need another 10 to 15 minutes for group one regarding the uh, PID control stuff later on.
Um, did you go through ever seeing part one? Oh, the Python. Yep. Great. Part two. The PCB design. That's the ESP modules schematic. You can find out the schematic online everywhere. So you will see what are the interface, which pin need to be shorted to where. So I showed you the process of looking for a appropriate DC regulator. So you need a pretty small footprint. As long as, and also in addition to that, you also need a low dropout voltage. So these are the constraints. So I find a table online and I was looking at all these different options from uh, AMS, but I didn't figure out any good ones over there. Uh, they are either obsolete, they're not being fabricated anymore, and or they uh, are too too big in terms of footprint. So I keep searching and find out the TLV751 from TI. So we need a little bit of circuit on that. So which is a voltage divider, so two resistors, and the output of this voltage divider is being shorted to the feedback port. And you don't need to think about what's uh, circuit design inside this chip. It must be pretty complicated. Uh, we just need to know how to use it, right? And that's a capacitor to hold the charges and also to remove the ripples or the V-in and C out as well. So here's the layout for that one. Uh, if you really want to lay out the same wires as whatever is showing here, which is fine, uh, probably it's going to improve the efficiency a little bit. But I didn't see the difference, significant difference between you know, the auto routing and this one. So if you're making a product of the company, probably you want to redesign the layout. Not super critical. Okay. So here's the equation to calculate V out and also the resistors. So what is the V out? We need a 3.3 volts for the V out from the regulator. Okay. And then you calculate back. Um, so here's the equation, 3.3 .3 volts equals to 0 0.55 times 1 plus this. So you can calculate R1 over R2. I got 5. And then I used 100K and 20K as the combination of the two resistor values. So you can form this ratio, which is 5. And you plug into this equation, you are getting 3.3 .3 volts as output to support your ESP module. Because the footprint of this DC regulator is tiny, very small, uh, you need to change the grid setting at the very beginning. So I highly recommend you uh, probably start with this, you know, for the setting of the grid, probably use the smallest one first. So if you use a larger, a relatively larger one, it's hard to uh, move these, uh, the paths around in, in, in this view. So, just let you know, it's very small. And I think it's, it's a good practice for you guys to train how to solder a tiny device like this. <laughs> I think this, this is pretty much the smallest device you can handle by your hand without any robot to assist you. Couldn't be smaller. So definitely you need a blower, right? And also the middle pad, you definitely need a T-stop. Right, so we don't want to cover that because underneath the chip, there's a metal plate. So that should be soldered to this pad. So we need a T-stop to cover it. And also we need to place a uh, pad to the middle and short it to the ground. So the pad will be shorted to ground. So make the library and make the device for this regulator, so you can use it in your schematic. Okay, 
going. Mm. Moving, moving. So here is the MPU 6050. So the accelerometer chip you have been using, uh, they have already soldered everything on the board. But here in this application, we are going to use the uh, individual IC chip instead of the module. The module is too big for us. So I ordered a lot of uh, MPU mod IC chips. So we need to know what are these uh, peripheral circuits required for this module. So I searched online and found out the MPU modules, the little PCBs circuit schematic. So these are the resistors, capacitors you need to connect to this IC chip. So make sure you have everything designed on your PCB and schematic. So that's the MPU 6050. So these are all the circuits required for this accelerometer. And the ESP module, there are a couple of pins need to be put up to the power. So one is enable pin, one is IO0 pin. So these two pins, except for the power and ground for the ESP module, you also have to pull up the enable pin EN and IO0 to 3.3 volts, keep in mind. So here's a schematic I found online, uh, which is a schematic for the module you purchased. So there are two switch uh, push buttons you can see on your ESP PCB board. There are two push buttons uh, pretty close to the USB port. And if you push it, for example, this guy, if you push the push button, it's going to sh short the IL0 pin to ground, which means it's going to reset your ESP module, will rerun or restart the program in the microcontroller. However, for our module, we don't we don't actually need it. I mean, because we don't have the space to to accommodate that push button and everything here. So what I did is I directly put everything up. I just use a capacitor to block the DC voltage. So the EN, which is here, and IL0, they are always put up to 3.3 volts. So there's no push button to reset it, keep in mind. You see here, if you push it, this is just 470, it's a pretty low resistance. It's gonna pull this down to the ground. But I don't have that push button here in my schematic. I directly just, I just put a 0.1 microfarad capacitor to block the DC to the ground. So the pin here, the EN pin and IL0 pin are always put up to 0.0 volts, which is fine. You just enable it. Yeah, you are not uploading to the mod, to the PCB. There's no function to upload it over there because I, I don't even have a um, USB, USB to serial convert, uh, converter. And also, I'm not preparing to do that. This is a product. So if I need to reprogram it, I would just blow it uh, off from the uh, PCB and reprogram from the little programmer. So that's the layout. And if you take a closer look at the layout, I have all these little uh, pads being placed in the middle of the, or over, overlapped with the ground plate. So all these vias, it's like a via array, and all the vias are actually this thing. Um, so the function of that one is to connect the metal from the metal plate to the bottom for the copper. You know, if you do not place all the vias in the middle of this ground pad, so you, you have all the metal running on the top, but the metal running at the bottom is not contributing too much to the heat dissipation. Right, so you need to drill the holes, and so the holes have metal inside because they are just metal vias. So it's gonna, uh, con a transfer the heat from the top to bottom copper for the copper can help with uh, dissipating the heat. 
because this is a wireless module, so it probably will generate a little, a little bit more heat compared to other modules. Uh, so I highly recommend you do this. And if you do DRC, you probably will see a lot of errors. Uh, just trying to tell you there are many overlaps. But I think as long as you know they are fine, you don't need to deal with it. So there might be an option so you can place all these uh, vias in the library when you are making this ESP module. So try it if you like. Uh, you don't have to, but you know if you are pulling this entire device to the layout as one device, probably it's not going to report any errors. And um, after you placed all these vias on the top of this ground plate, you also need to make the connections, right? So just short all the vias to ground. You have to do that because they have to be grounded. And also don't forget to check all these uh, T-stops, see if it's been covered or not. So you can see they are just bare coppers, uh, which is uh, doing the job we are expecting. So that's everything for this one. And let's see how how long do we need to complete this this uh, project. I think I gave you how many weeks? Three weeks until here. Until uh, week eleven. Okay. So when we are working on these two tutorials, I think it's gonna spend uh, about two weeks. And during the, during the same time, because these, these tutorials are simple, they are just very fundamental ones. It lets you guys how to use uh, the SC32's IDE instead of always using the you know, Arduino IDE, which is like entry-level programmer. So just take a look at the other products. So it takes two weeks, but this will be super simple. And during the same time, uh, you are going to work uh, as a, a different teams to complete one project, which is either the ESP32 one or the temperature monitoring one, and make it into a product, like a commercial product. I'm going to give you the, the grading rubrics later on, but just keep in mind, this is the scope of this class for the for this semester. And I was hoping I was more ambitious at the very beginning, uh, which is fine because I didn't know how much we can do, right? So after I uh, see your progress, I know what is more reasonable for you guys to complete within this semester. Just three months. I think this is just a three month semester. I think you guys have learned something, right? Not huge amount of new things, but I know you guys, at least that uh, you know how to design a PCB um, from scratch, at least, right? And program all these microcontrollers. Um, any questions for anything for the scope of this class? And you know what to do, right? So you're going to work on the ESP module for the next, uh, for starting from now and for the following three weeks. And after that, we're going to have uh, two weeks new tutorials regarding ST32 and MST430 microcontrollers, very simple. And during the same time, you are going to form teams, two students per team, okay, uh, to complete uh, the project. It can be the ESP32 one or it can be the temperature monitor monitoring uh, project. And uh, the rubrics will be provided pretty soon. And uh, you need to present the result in a video, upload to YouTube and to your website, but you don't have to present in a class physically. And the final exam is Monday of the 14th week, all right? Okay, so that's everything for group two. You can leave if you like. Yes. Uh, what are they? Okay. Okay. Do you want to get it after this or during the robotics? I think Okay. Cool. Cheyenne, uh, I can talk to you after this. Can I wait for a couple minutes? There, there's a little project I probably want to.
talk with you. Yeah. yeah wait for like 10 minutes. All right, for group one. For this one, I don't think. Um, no, no, so you are still here, right? And I really don't think one week is reasonable. I will give you two weeks to work on this project. The PID controller, total cell, LDR, right? And another one week, probably, for the accelerometer. So you are going to learn I2C protocol, which is super important. One week, okay? And then this project will start here. I'm going to move it to here. The four-wheel uh, four smart robot car design is pretty similar, not similar, you know, it's going to do this pretty similar job compared to the robot car you learned in circuit one. Uh, but it's going to be controlled by microcontrollers instead of the analog circuit you know, the, the boring one, but this one will be more fun. And so I think it makes sense to give you two or two to three weeks. You can see if you start working on that project from here, probably you need uh, two weeks, then, you know, you don't have two weeks actually, but I mean, a little bit more than one week is pretty reasonable. Um, probably working on a team. And we can use that one as a project, if that's reasonable. And the final exam will be a little bit different from, from yours to group, the group two's final exam. So I'm gonna uh, test you on the I2C protocol and you know PID theory and give you some programming uh, questions during the exam. So have a little time constraint to complete everything within an hour and a half. And um, you guys will learn more about microcontrollers in uh, robotics too. So there will be a lot more interesting projects over there. Um, and in junior design, Max Master 315, so Dr. Majid, will teach machine learning, you know, image processing and machine learning uh, related projects over there for C students. But for engineering students, if you like, if you would like to take robotics too, if you still have a chance, I know you are graduating, but if you, if you have a chance, uh, you, you, can, you can take it in the future. And uh, there, there will be more microcontroller stuff covered over there. And also you can see, Yeah, robotics too. Yeah, I will be teaching that in the future. Uh, I don't think it's all for next semester. It's probably in, in take a look. Are you graduating in April? Okay. Yes, if you let me know, I, I will give you all right. On that. But are you graduating in April? No. So it's a full only class. So 2021, so next fall. It will be over next fall. Because Robotics 1 is being being taught by Dr. Hakes, and he uh, mostly used the uh, uh, MATLAB to cover the theory of the control theory of the uh, robotics and a little bit uh, hardware design. I think he asked the students to have some uh, little robots uh, fabricated uh, towards the end of semester last in the spring because of the pandemic. So I don't think they, they get anything done during that time, time frame. Uh, but in robotics too, it's a project oriented. Uh, what I did this semester is so we covered all the different types of sensors and actuators, you know, all these kind of sensors you can you can see in the industry for about two weeks. And the power supply design, 
for another two weeks. And after the first four, four weeks, we started working on different uh, projects uh, for the entire semester, for the rest of the semester. Uh, there's a balancing car uh, project, a two-wheel car to balance itself and being controlled by a remote, uh, it's a wireless uh, remote controller with a joystick. That one takes about a month to, for students to, to design and develop. And after that, it's a ro robot arm project uh, with two my controllers talking to each other and uh, trying to make a robot arm being controlled by, you know, one of the my controllers. So that that's another microcontroller intensive uh, class. And you know, for the guys here in group two in this class, they were in my three fifteen in the spring. So what they did over there is whatever you are doing here in this class, you know. So literally, no matter what which which one you are attending right now, because you already you have attended this my control class, and you don't have to take this class again in the future. And if you are CE, you are taking 315 in the future. The professor who are teaching junior design probably won't use my controller that much. Like Dr. Majid, he's he will use, you know, do a software um, uh, focused uh, project. You know, but which is good for you. I mean, both are pretty, pretty good. You know, you need to learn both. And so, if you want to learn something more about my controllers, so I think the opportunity will be in robotics too. And also, if you look at the tutorials here, they are all available on my website. If you want to check out any of the tutorials, just let me know. I will give you the kits and parts you can still working on that. Um, all these projects over here. But there's just no like incentives like, getting credits by doing all these projects. If you are willing to learn, I, I'm glad to help you guys, give you the kids. And let me see, anything else? Oh yeah, PID control. Five minutes for PID control, then, then we are done. So let's go back to this tutorial, there are just a couple of things I need to cover. So remember I mentioned uh, the code I provided on the website is not, is not ideal. I need your help to revise it. If you use my code, you can definitely repeat the results I showed on this uh, website. Definitely, because this, these are from this code. So like this one, what is this one doing? Yeah, let's start from uh, from somewhere you are familiar with. Okay, remember we we were trying to. So what's the hardware connection? See here, we have a photo sensor. <clears throat> and we have a little LED being placed pretty close to this photo sensor. Right? If you do not turn on this LED, you are getting a, a signal from the ambient light because you are, it's always there some, some light in the room. So there will be a offside value. So this is what I detected in the room. And, but actually you don't have a time delay. So really it, it takes some time to, to turn on the LED to the full intensity. So you need a little time delay in order to read the full intensity of that LED, uh, which is this value. So that's uh, intensity without LED, and that's the intensity like you directly detect the intensity after you turn it on, like this one, you turn it on and you directly read it. So it's not accurate value because you know, from here to here, it just takes microseconds. The light, the LED is not fully turned on yet. So it needs a delay to be inserted in the middle. So you turn on the LED, wait for a second, and then read the intensity afterwards. So you can see the difference here, 700 compared to 900. So this will be more accurate. And after you know, if you 
add the light uh, comes from the LED to your photo sensor in addition to whatever the light intensity in the room. And it's going to be 900 something. So you can set up the, you know, the goal, the set point to 800. Is that making sense? You see, if you, you have a photo sensor here, right? You have a photo sensor. The photo sensor is going to detect the ambient light, no matter what. You couldn't control it. You can, right? You can turn off the light, right? But assuming we are not turning off the lights. So put a, so you have a, the LDR in the room, and it's going to detect the light from the, from the room, which is 600 something, 637, I think, right, from the rating. Right, 677. And the, the, um, it's not actuator, but you know, sometimes in, in, in the industry, you have actuator to change the value. So the LED is being used as something to, to change the value of the sensor. And if you turn it on, fully on, it's going to add photons to the LDR in addition to the ambient light. So eventually, so the maximum intensity the LDR can receive is 924. So you can see it's going to change from 677 to 934, 24. All right? So you couldn't make it dimmer. Your microcontroller cannot control this light to make it dimmer. But whatever the microcontroller can control is to not fully turn on the LED. You fully turn it on to the to the uh, full intensity, brightness, right? So you are getting 900 something. If you give a lower voltage or lower power to the LED, it's going to be dimmer. So possibly you can get, you know, 800, 850, something like that. So let's set up the goal in the middle of 677 to 924. I just pick up 800. You can pick up 750, doesn't matter, right? So the setup point should be in the middle because you know it's gonna, it will be reachable, right? If you make the LED not fully turn on, then you can reach that point at some time. So, so it's controllable, right? That's, that's the value you wanna use. I mean, if you pick up 400, what's gonna happen for the set, for the set point or for the goal? Can you set up 400? Why? Too low. You couldn't, you couldn't make it dimmer compared to 477. That's already the offside in the room, right? Can you make it thousand? No, your LED cannot reach that level. Your LED cannot be that bright. So it has to be something in the middle. Okay, so that's a really sweet PID control example for you guys to to work with. Are we in system control right now? Okay. So now we know what we're doing, right? And so here's a PID controller. You see the, I set up 400 as a set point. Definitely it won't work. Because you can see the reading, the readings are here. How can you reach 400? You couldn't. You probably want to say, hey, I can. I can just use my hand to cover that light sensor. What's the problem with it? Since I, I'm saying you couldn't make it as dim as 400, but you are saying you can cover it by your hand in order to reach 400. So what's the problem? Is your hand controlled by Arduino? No. So it's going to be different CPUs. One CPU is in your Arduino. Another CPU is in here. So your Arduino is not controlling here. Can you? If you can, you are probably getting a Nobel Prize. You couldn't control that. You need everything to be executed by one CPU. So the Arduino is detecting that light intensity See if it's reaching 800. If not, make the LED brighter. If it is, just stop. So you can reach the 800 level. But your hand is something else independent to that CPU. 
right? It's just a mess, messed up everything in the system. You get it? Because your LED, which you can control, cannot make everything dimmer, but can only adding photons to the to the sensor. So definitely set, set up uh, 400 as a set point is not working totally. So it can never reach 400. So now I add another extra LED to the system. So the purpose is to see if your system can respond to this additional variable quickly, quick enough, or effective, uh, effectively. So see here, I am going to turn on the LED to the LEDR, which is being placed in the room. And there will be a certain value being read from here. And if I push, so if I do not push this push button, this LED will be off, right? If I push it, it's gonna form that circuit and turn it on. So what's happening? If I set up the everything to 800, for example, and my, my Arduino can maintain a pretty reasonable PWM wave to have this guy at a certain brightness, to have 800 reading from here, right? It is, it is doable, right? However, if you have another, the second LED, pretty close to that LED, or pretty close to this LDR, you push it, what's gonna happen? Everything is done, so before you push it, it's already at 800 reading. You know, because if you do not turn on this one, it's, it's gonna be 677. However, you have a PID controller inside, so the, my controller is giving a power, specific power with a certain duty cycle, which is the PWM waveform, to this LED, to not fully turn it on, but partially. Hey, Trevor. And so you can maintain 800. You know what I mean? Before you push this push button, it's gonna be 800 here. Stabilized at 800. If you push it, what's gonna happen? If you push it. So see, everything's already working, right? So the LEDR is sensing the LED and the Arduino already detects you know, the intensity and giving a feedback. So uh, assign a specific duty cycle to the LED. So it's not too bright, not too dim, and exactly at 800 for the reading. Okay, and then there's another LED, you push it, it's adding more photons to that LDR. And what's gonna happen? Arduino will detect a higher intensity from the LDR and it's gonna be above 800. So it's gonna dim or turning, you know, make the LED here less brighter than before to reach that 800 goal. That's how the feedback loop working here. It's always adjusting everything to make it to the set point. So that's how that works. If you look at the video, <clears throat> see 800, right? I push it, you can see the detector signal is high, but it's going down and down until the set point again. Because it's trying to dim the first LED, even though I push the push button to turn on the second LED. And after I release it, you can see the signal will be lower than 800, and then trying to go up to 800 again. So see the two events, right? I push, I push the push button at this time point. It takes time because I 
modify it again to let you visualize the entire process. It's a horrible PID controller right now. And now, I, and then I release, I released the um, push button. So tell me why it's lower than 800. Why it's lower than 800? Yeah, so, so remember, it used to be 800, right? So because the first LED is contributing photons to the LDR, right? It's contributing 200 because it used to be 600 something. So it's contributing 200 to make 800, all right? And after I push the second LED, it's contributing 100 or not 100. It's actually contributing a little bit more than that. I say 100. So the second LED is contributing 100 to the LDR. So the first LED has to be dimmer to maintain the 800. So the first LED used to contribute 100, 200. But now since I have another LED is contributing 100, so the first LED has to contribute how much to maintain 800? 100. OK, and then I release the push button. So the second LED will be off. It's contributing zero. So the first LED has to contribute how much? 200. Is that making sense? But before the PID controller make it to 200, it takes some time, right? Because I have a you know, terrible PID controller. It takes so long to respond. I just let you guys visualize everything. So that's why you see a dip here, because it was a it, it was only contributing 100 at the, at the point, at the time point, I released the push button. Because it's so slow, I just realized, you know, after, because the other one is contributing 100, so it only needs to contribute 100. But however, after I released the push button, it is still contributing 100, but CPU is telling him, hey, it's too dim, just getting more photons to start adding, adding, adding until 200. That's what happens here. You'll see a dip, and then it start contributing until 800. It's gonna stabilize at 800 eventually. So the blue line is a set point. See 800 on the left hand side, and the readings they are the real uh, real time readings from the from the LDR. Okay, so that's uh, pretty bad. PID controller since it takes so long. Respond. So it's the same stuff, but I modify. So take a look here and let me know if this makes sense. So, what is this spike showing you? I turn the light on. Then, what's happening? Yes, really quickly. You see? I push the push button, I turn on the second light, and it's gonna dip the first LED to make it to 800. See here, what's, what happened? I released that push button. And because I have a really good gain, or not, you know, if it's not perfect, but it's kind of uh, working, so that, Again, for the PID controller, can respond super quickly and pull it up to 800 again. All right, so the last one. See what's happening here. What's happening? I'm changing the side point. I'm changing the side point. And the real time reading is following. You couldn't even see the time delay. Do you have a time delay? Yes, you do. But it's not super significant. You can see the little gap here. Maybe if I stretch this signal, you might, might, might be able to see the time delay from the real-time detection and the set point. But you can see that this is a really sweet system 
whenever I change the side point, the reading can reach that side point pretty much instantly. Do you understand this? What's going on here? So what's happening for the LEDs? Like when it was here, I push it, it jumps to here. So what's happening? This is a push button. I add it to the breadboard, right? I push it. I have a, a push button detection program running the, in Arduino, and I detect that uh, pushing activity, and I count by you know you can add something a certain value to the set point, for example. Okay. So your set point is changed. So what's happening for the LEDs? Become brighter. Which one? You only have one. LED, right? You don't need the, the second LED for this for this one. You just need a one LED. You push it. You you have a higher set point, so the LED will mm, become brighter. So that's a new set point. And LDR LDR uh, will keep receiving the signal in real time, so you can see all these lines. But there are actually thousands of data points. So it's reading all the data points, trying to reach that set point. There will be some overshooting, but it's going to come back later. And there are so many noise as well. You can use a, a low pass filter to filter them out later on. But did you get this? What's going on here? OK. And in addition to that, uh, do not use what I'm showing you here in my script. So you can see that. Uh, I used this, which works. You know, it's the same as the PID theory, PID controller theory. I keep accumulating the PID to the old PID value. So it's the same as you are uh, accumulating the I part for this equation. You, you can see somebody will use this, but if you use it, it's going to be fine, but it's just not, uh, you know, not that honest to the theory. So if you look at my handwritings in here, I have, you know, told you uh, the equation, what the equation looks like. It looks like this. So we need a, the PIDI part you are accumulating to the I part you know, by doing this. And for the PID value, it should be this, KP times error plus PIDI, which is from here, plus the differential gain. And just play around with the different gains, different options, and see if you can, you can reach the same result. Just do not use what I'm what I'm doing here. It's, it's the same result, but it's just not not that perfect. Okay. You, no, it's, it's the equation. So it's going to reach the same result, but it's just not that standard. <laughs> no, because you can see. Let's take a look at the, that one. So see this one? So the differential gain is fine. It's just the current error minus the previous error. So that is correct. But I didn't accumulate the I part, integral part here. So what I did is I accumulate everything. See, PID value equals to PID value plus something. Let's keep adding to to it. So it's doing the same job as this one, as you accumulating the I part, integral part. Is it doing the same job? But you, you don't you don't have to do this, right? So you can just accumulate in the I part and uh, do whatever I wrote on the paper in the last lecture. I use that equation instead of this one. It's going to do the same job. And <clears throat> so see here, um, I set the I gain to be zero, you know, the integral gain to be zero. 
and I still get the correct result because the equation here is accumulating it, integrating it, even though I have a ki to be zero. So that's why I still ha actually have the integral part in this equation. So you can see it's not really legit. It's going to work, but just not perfect. So <clears throat> you do need a, a, a proportional part, and you do need the integral part, which is getting rid of the overshooting and undershootings. So you can stabilize everything to the set point. Uh, you do not necessarily keep the differential part in there. So I set, I set the differential gain to be zero. Uh, but if you are doing a more fine analysis, if you look at all the data points, probably if you, you know, keep uh, tuning the, all the gains here, and including the differential gain as well, you can get a perfect result. Um, but you don't, you don't have to include the differential gain into it. So I think proportional and integral will be good enough in a lot of cases, or the proportional and differential. And of course, if you have all of them, which is even better, they probably couldn't be able to see the any differences um, virally, you know. Okay, so that's everything for this for this uh, tutorial. I think it takes. I'm going to give you one more week. Uh, so today is here, and I think I'll give you two weeks to complete everything. And you do need to plot the result in Python if you are CE. If you are not CE, plot it in MATLAB. Make sense? So all these data points. Save the data and plot in either Python or MATLAB. Okay? All right, that's everything for today.